In the Cubs Quotient, How the Chicago Cubs Changed the World by Scott Rowan, readers learn that the history lessons many students are taught in school are more myth than fact. The truth behind the real history is more interesting than what we thought we knew, that the good guys weren't always good, the bad guys weren't always bad, and the difference between the two is less than you might think. The Cubs Quotient is also the world's first book powered by Geoverse, a publishing tool that allows readers the opportunity to more fully experience the Cubs Quotient beyond the printed page. Contemporary Christianity was forever altered by the Chicago Cubs at the turn of the 20th century, not because a seemingly endless string of non-championship seasons led fans to pray for help, that came generations later. The prayers increasing each year that the memories faded from the Cubs' most recent World Series appearance three quarters of a century earlier in 1945. The entertainment spectacle that televised Christian evangelism has evolved into today began on State Street in Chicago at a time in history when Chicago's Northside team dominated the national baseball landscape. The Chicago Cubs ruled baseball in the 1880s, winning five league championships in seven seasons. One of the leaders of the team that was then known as the White Stockings was Billy Sunday. Faster than a hot rumor, Billy Sunday was an outfielder who was by many accounts the fastest player in the league. He was able to run down any pop fly and scorch the base paths to help manufacture runs. One night, while he was out drinking on State Street with a group of teammates led by infamous party monger Mike King Kelly, Sunday stumbled upon the Pacific Garden Mission on State Street. Sunday immediately was hooked and became an avid volunteer at the Pacific Garden Mission. Whenever he was not at the ballpark, Sunday could be found at the mission that was moved from its location on State Street to a new location in 2007 for expansion of a local school. After his playing days were over, Sunday poured himself body and soul into becoming a missionary. His experience playing in front of large crowds made him a natural entertainer who drew massive congregations to his sermons. Eager to reach as many converts as possible, Sunday took his show on the road, forever altering what the general public would come to know as evangelism. Instead of temporary tents and traditional services filled with dirges, Sunday built wooden tabernacles that grew to be some of the largest structures of their day. Music was updated and expanded to attract larger crowds. And enlisting the public support of the United States military was another cornerstone of Sunday's sermons, adding, for love of God and country, to the permanent lexicon of American terminology. But hatred of alcohol and its effects on society was the daily battle that Sunday waged. His war against alcohol made him friends with the richest and most powerful men in the world. It also led to his famous Boo sermon, in which he deplored alcohol and its evil attributes. Here is an excerpt from Billy Sunday's Boo's sermon. And this great day we're having, Mr. Sunday. Folks, I'm going to talk to you a little while this afternoon on the 18th Amendment. The Proposed 18th Amendment is the most popular thing, my friend, in American and English. But you use this to fall against the 18th Amendment of the Constitution. It's an attempt on the part of the old brewers and the old distillers and the old saloon keepers and the old bartenders and the whiskey politicians and newspapers to bind and rivet my friends, the brewers around the neck of the American people again for their own profit. Their arguments against prohibition are as weak as soup made out of the stand of the chicken and the stars here. When you compare prohibition at its worst with the saloon at its best, prohibition's a million times better. And the ills you would fly to by receiving the 18th Amendment are a thousand times worse than the ones you'd fly from by leaving it, my friend, as it is. Oh, I know that great anti-prohibition volcano in the United States, aroused and directed by the enemies of prohibition and Americanism, is bombing both its political lab and corruption in a current that's broad and deep and wide and speaking with frightful destruction over our land. And didn't say to leave no office shop, store, factory farm, school, or college that is not started by a damnable blight. Why, lighting up on his foot, like the demons of hell are the political enemies. Causing and steering and steering of those that bear resistant damnable blight. I may be crushed by it, but bow to it, I never will. No history tells us many free countries have lost their liberty. America may lose hers. If she does, my proudest boast will be not that I was the last to deserve it, but that I never deserved it. There's no neutral ground in this crack. It's work of a life and life to be filled. I absolutely refuse to vote for any man, for mayor, for governor, for representative, for senator, or for president, who is hostile to and will not openly support the 18th Amendment or all other amendments, no matter what coding for 
No matter what political party you may belong to, it will not vote for the 14th Amendment or any other amendment of the Constitution. Someone said to me the other day, oh, prohibition uh, interferes with my personal liberty. Certainly, every law in the statute book interferes with the liberty of the cook that wants to break it. It don't interfere with my liberty because I keep it. The shepherd tears the keep the wolf away from the throat of the sheep for which we keep the thankful. And then the wolf complains against the shepherd for interfering with his personal liberty. That was said to me the other day, oh, prohibition is responsible for the depression. Oh, the world, it's worldwide. Then if it's worldwide, what causes it in the other nations? What causes the depression in Germany? What causes it in England? Well, it had two million men on go ever since the war. And America's the only dry nation in the world. It's because the world is inheritance from the war. That's why, what? That was said to me, oh, prohibition makes bootleggers and slum runners and the moon shiners. Oh, we had bootleggers and moon shiners when we were under the British flag. For 155 years, the stars and stripes have waved over America. We've had bootleggers and we have them now. Like a fellow wrote to a doctor and said, Dear doctor, I had a wart on my face and weighed a pound and a half. After taking 12 bottles of your medicine, my face is gone, but the wart is there yet. <laughs> The tours are gone, the distillers are gone, but the bootlegs are in the moon shiner, my friend. He's curious in the face. Let him say, well, we're drinking more whiskey and poison whiskey. If so, why is the death rate of America is less than ever been in the history of the United States? Oh, will briars and briars and thorns and thistles cause a wheat field to produce more and better wheat? Is the better of the rattlesnake good nourishment for a savior? Will a lightning bolt pull the tree and more delicate furniture? Is fire good, my friend, to increase the aroma and the beauty, my friend, of the rose? I was said to me, well, they don't keep it, we'll repeal it. All right, then, repeal the issues of the Ten Commandments. They don't keep the Ten Commandments. They lie, they steal, they commit adultery, they murder, and yet you know without the Ten Commandments there'd be no civilization. You know that society and civilization rests on morals. Morals rest on religion. Religion rests on faith in God and in Jesus Christ. Over the Mexican border 1,500 miles long, and the Canadian border 3,000 miles long, and the Atlantic and the Pacific border 5,000 miles long, and Cuba and the Bermuda just next door, and the most thoroughly organized gang of thugs in the cutthroat on the hunger this side of hell. It's no easy job, I want to tell you. I'm even learning to call this every other day that 90% of the rum runners, the hijackers, the bootleggers, my friends, and the rip rapiers, they are born of foreign parents. And the 70% of them have never been naturalized. I say she put every unnaturalized law <laughs> Take away the citizenship papers from every man that's been naturalized when he shows himself a cook and on second offense he quotes him also. America's going to be run by American cross pocket will. And whenever a man, I accept the friends and stand with open arms, welcome any man from any country. But when they leave the foreign land and come to America to build homes and rear their families and live on the protection poles of the stars and stripes, they alter themselves to the land of their adoption. They leave their capital and their ideas back across the sea. Where they came from. America! America! There's no place for a defender to live in. And there's no place beneath the stars who strike for the arm that will not defend it and for the heart that doesn't love it in the world. No. Sunday's efforts directly led to the ratification of the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution in 1919, known by many today as Prohibition. Sunday will forever be one of the most famous Cubs of all time for his innovation aside from baseball. Frank Sinatra and Al Capone both owe parts of their careers to Willie Sunday, not to mention the billion dollar business of evangelism today. These stories and many more are explored in the Cubs Quotient, How the Chicago Cubs Changed the World by Scott Rowan that is available at Amazon.com and SherpaMultimedia.com.